ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our 2012 Apartment Market Economic and Capital Markets Outlook. My name is Hassam Naji. I'm the Managing Director of Research and Advisory Services for Marcus and Millichap, and on behalf of our entire management team and our multifamily agents across the country, we welcome you to this program. I am joined today by my partner, Bill Hughes, who is the head of our Capital Markets Division and Marcus Millichap Capital Corporation with loan originators nationwide. Uh, this morning's uh, program, this afternoon's program, depending on which time zone you're in, is a little bit different than what we've done in the past. This is our first video webcast, which I hope you will enjoy and uh, get more of the uh, benefit of an interactive dialogue with us. I want to, um, uh, for those of you that are coming back to our program from previous shows, I'd like to remind you of the um, F5 key, which is uh, uh, the solution to screens freezing or slides not advancing. Please use that if you run into that trouble. We also have um, something new uh, this time around, and that is an audience polling uh, question. I'm going to be asking a few questions along the way during the presentation, which we'd love to have your input on. So please take a moment and answer those questions, your opinion on them, and we'll be able to show uh, the results on screen. Also, you can submit questions, as you always have been able to do with our uh, webcasts, and I'll be monitoring uh, the questions coming in throughout the presentation, and Bill and I will address uh, what's on your mind. So with that, uh, our objective today is to give you an idea of what's happening with the economy, capital markets, and, of course, apartment fundamentals and investment uh, trends. And we're going to start out this morning by talking about uh, the economy. And... Um, I would uh, start out by depicting where we are uh, currently economically in a state of transition. We have a lot of uh, global concerns at a macro level that are affecting the U.S. What is happening in the Eurozone certainly has an effect uh, on our sentiment here in the U.S. and the global financial markets. What is happening in the U.S. Uh, for sale housing market is another headwind uh, and continues to hold back economic expansion in many ways. Uh, and, of course, our political logjam, um, which led to the U.S. Uh, debt downgrade back in August, and that raised a lot of fears of another recession here in the U.S. Well, the good news is that, as you can see from this graph, uh, the third quarter GDP, gross domestic product, which is a measurement of total U.S. economic activity, came in at 2.5%, well above uh, the fear level uh, that would indicate us going into a recession. Now, that is not strong enough to create robust uh, jobs, uh, but it is clearly strong enough and well above the levels that would suggest anything uh, resembling a recession. Nevertheless, we are in this transition phase away from a lot of government initiatives that drove the initial part of the recovery out of the recession uh, and onto a very hesitant private, private sector. Um, and because of these headwinds that I mentioned earlier and a high degree of fear and uncertainty in the marketplace, companies aren't expanding uh, very aggressively. They're not hiring very aggressively. Uh, and that's going to be the condition we expect throughout most of 2012. But it should be uh, stated that uh, companies aren't panicking, where a lot of ex uh, expectations were uh, projecting layoffs and, um, and again, uh, contracting economic numbers or a recession. That has not occurred. Our position uh, going into the last few months was that the U.S. economy was likely to stagnate and um, be uh, anchored by that stagnation for some time. And, and we believe that is still the case. And uh, we are working our way through that stagnation. So the question is, is there any pent-up demand that's going to come out? We believe 2012 will be uh, slightly better than 2011 in terms of the momentum of growth. Uh, but again, well short of uh, levels of expansion that uh, would be considered exciting. The most important measurement of uh, economic activity, of course, is job growth. And the, here is a good news, bad news situation, as you can see on this graph. On the left, you can see that uh, the reliance on temporary employment has uh, come down quite a bit. Uh, right after the end of the recession, companies were too nervous in hiring permanent workers, so they relied on the labor pool of temporary workers, and you can see the blue line really skyrocketing. More recently, we've seen addition of permanent workers, which is encouraging. However, the pace of job growth is still not enough to make a big dent in unemployment and certainly not big enough to uh, call this a, uh, an exciting recovery just yet. Uh, we did see some revisions upward to the past few months' job numbers, 
And even in the midst of the uh, U.S. debt downgrade concerns and the European debt problems, uh, companies, uh, private companies added over 100,000 jobs a month over the past three or four months, which is very encouraging in terms of our forecast and expectation that we'll stay in this modest growth mode, uh, somewhat of a stagnation, and avoid recession in 2012. Uh, one of the uh, major anchors to the U.S. economic growth right now is the for sale housing market. Uh, typically, the housing market contributes a lot to economic activity uh, during a recovery, but as is well publicized, we still have two or three uh, large waves of foreclosures coming through the system. Uh, we still have a lack of confidence by consumers in terms of buying homes and whether we've bottomed in house prices, and therefore, uh, residential investment or the or the for sale housing market is uh, only contributing 2% to economic activity. What's interesting is uh, the fact that another indicator, such as business investment or exports, are contributing a lot more to the U.S. economy right now. Exports, for example, which are growing at 7 or 8% a year, contribute 13% to our total economic output, which is not very often covered uh, in terms of headlines and, and, and the media. But the housing troubles uh, with housing only contributing 2% to economic output is uh, emphasized over and over again. Now, all this bad news on the for sale housing side, of course, is, has translated to strength on the rental market side, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Another point of strength for the U.S. economy is uh, the fact that we're on stronger footing. Uh, if you look at retail sales in the U.S., uh, for some time they have exceeded the 2007 pre-recession peak levels by now by over 6%. Um, and even though the trend line shown here on the left of this graph was uh, quite scary at the time that the recession hit, the Great Recession hit, and was unprecedented for us to see the percentage change in retail sales nosedive to the degree that it did, since then, it's important to note that the consumer has come back. And um, uh, the fact that the retail sales make up 70% uh, of our economic activity and the trend line on retail sales give us that added confidence that although we're not growing at a very rapid rate, we should be able to avoid recession. Uh, it's also unrealistic to expect retail sales to continue growing at, at recent pace uh, because the uh, consumer is pretty well cornered. Uh, so that's where we need the, the uh, business investment and the um, uh, corporate side of the ledger to really kick in and that's where the uncertainty and fear and so on from the headwinds that I talked about earlier are keeping companies from entering an aggressive expansion. Having said that, uh, another important part of why I believe the U.S. economy is on stronger footing is the fact that the jobs that we have added over the past 12 months have been very broad-based. Uh, first of all, let's not forget that we've added almost 1.9 million private sector jobs, which is shown on this graph. Uh, even though that is a disappointing number, uh, as to where we should be at this point of a recovery, it's still a pretty respectable uh, number in total. And what's more important is that it's well distributed. Professional and business services added 562,000 jobs. Education and health care, 427,000 jobs. Trade, transportation, 330,000 jobs. Even manufacturing added 220,000 jobs. That goes back to the export trend that I was uh, sharing with you earlier. Um, leisure, hospitality, over 200,000 jobs. Uh, so the broad-based nature of the job creation further gives us confidence that we should stay in this track of expansion, lacking the kind of momentum that we want. And, of course, the, uh, the government sector, with over 300,000 job losses, continues to drag down the economy for obvious reasons. Um, that is dominated by local and state municipalities that are still cutting jobs. Our expectation going into 2012 is a continuation of this modest and um, relatively lackluster growth pace, uh, having gone from significant job losses of 8.5 million. If you look at some uh, prior recessions that I chose to share with you today, 81, 82, 73, 75, those were chosen for their similarity in some ways to the Great Recession uh, that we just experienced. We're going to lack the kind of V-shaped pattern with big job losses followed by big job gains with well above average uh, kind of trends for two, three years after a recession. It's not going to occur this time because of the major headwinds and, and having to deleverage both on the private side and the government side, holding back the rate of uh, growth, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, nevertheless, 
Uh, if we add 1.7 million jobs this year, which we believe we're on track to do, uh, and followed by the 2.2 million jobs we're expecting for next year, it is slowly but surely beginning to fill the hole that was created with 8.5 million job losses. Uh, disappointing, but nevertheless uh, positive. Um, I'm going to go to our first audience polling question, and that is, in 2012, do you believe renter demand will be stronger, weaker, or about the same? Now, if you take a moment to really think through whether, based on what you're seeing out in the marketplace, renter demand uh, will continue at this uh, at this uh, recent pace, uh, it would be very interesting for us to share those results with everybody who's participating on, on today's presentation. So please take a moment and answer those questions. Uh, it should be a fairly simple process with the multiple choices, and uh, we'll move on and we'll share the results here uh, shortly. One of the key things about the apartment market has been its tremendous recovery coming out of the recession well ahead of job growth. This graph shows you the pattern of net absorption versus job creation. And as you can see, coming out of 2009, net absorption far exceeded job growth uh, to the levels uh, that we have not seen in, in recent history, even 2002 when the economy was in the midst of uh, a pretty healthy growth. And there are several factors that uh, have driven this pattern. Um, one, uh, to begin with, is the fact that even though uh, job growth uh, is viewed as only one of several factors that drive apartment renter demand, uh, it is important to note that over 70% of the new jobs that have been created have gone to young adults aged between 20 and 34. Uh, and those individuals that had moved in with family, the Census Department estimates that some 3 million young adults moved in with family between 2005 and 2010 who are now finding jobs are coming out and holding their own or creating their own renter household. That's an important indicator. Another important indicator is the kind of um, demand that we're seeing by type of uh, property in that um, we're seeing the recovery being very broad based um, partly because of those uh, large capture share of jobs but also because of the fact that um, uh, we, we've seen rent declines to the, port, to the point that they have become more affordable for a, a lot of the young workers. Now, going forward, that might become an issue. But at this point, if we have the results of our first um, audience question, it would be a great time to share it. I, those will be coming up in, in just a moment. Um, the, um, the pattern that you see here on this graph shows Class A apartments uh, recovering quicker than Class B apartments. And that has uh, partly uh, to do with, the, number one, the job creation we talked about, but also uh, the fact that uh, as rents declined, Class A properties uh, attracted some Class B tenants. And as we've seen the vacancies come down and uh, rents firm up, we're not expecting to see that continue to the level that we've seen it in the past. Um, affordability is going to become a major question, as is the the question mark as to how much property owners believe demand will will remain strong. And I think at this point we do have the first uh, results of the audience uh, questions, correct? If we can show those. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the answer. Great. Can we show that? Great. Very interesting to see that 57% of you believe that... Uh, uh, demand for apartments will be stronger in 2012, and uh, roughly 40% believe it will be about the same. So even the 40% expecting demand to be about the same uh, are basically giving a pretty, vote, pretty high vote of confidence for the apartment market because demand, as we saw earlier on the, on the graph, has been very, very strong. At this point, I'm actually going to launch our second audience question, and that question has to do with uh, whether how important job growth is to this expectation of, uh, of uh, renter demand. So the question is, if job growth does not improve over the next 12 months, will apartment demand contract, stay the same, or still get stronger? So if we don't have job growth over the next year, will demand contract, stay the same, or get stronger? So if you can... Uh, uh, take a moment to answer that question. Uh, we'll be able to share the importance of, of job growth to the forecast for, uh, for demand. Uh, same process if you can choose of the multiple 
uh, answers, uh, the most likely scenario for next year that would help us. Uh, the, um, going back to the graph that is uh, uh, showing on your uh, slide um, screen, I do want to point out the construction side of this cycle as well. We've talked about the demand. We've talked about the differences between Class B and Class A, uh, vacancy improvement. But, of course, a lot has to do with the supply side. We hear uh, quite a bit from our uh, developer clients around the country that they're working on bringing new product to the marketplace, and that product uh, would be de uh, developed and delivered probably in 2013, 2014. But in the foreseeable future, uh, given the difficulty of entitlement and so on in some of the more favored markets um, and the difficulty of, uh, of financing, which we'll discuss with Bill later on for construction, um, we do not believe the supply side of the equation will derail the current recovery in apartments um, for at least the foreseeable future. There might be pockets of over overbuilding, but at a macro level, we don't anticipate that to become a problem. Um, in terms of the um, trends around the country, uh, you frequently ask us to rank markets and talk about metro-level trends. There is some fascinating trends uh, in terms of the year-over-year -year vacancy changes and the ranking of currently low vacancy markets and high vacancy markets that are shown on this graph. This is as of the third quarter of 2011, and you can see the markets with the lowest vacancies are shown on the left versus the, one with the, the ones with the highest vacancies shown on the right. Minneapolis, New York, San Jose, Portland, San Diego, San Francisco, Milwaukee not only dominate the low vacancy uh, ranking, but note that they're all showing improvement or drop, further drop in vacancy uh, over the past 12 months, which is very interesting. Even markets like uh, you know, D.C. Uh, and uh, Philadelphia, which have been pretty healthy, uh, continue to show improvement. Conversely, if you look at the high vacancy markets, those markets have now also entered recovery in that the construction pipeline that typically keeps those markets on the right side of the ledger has, for the most part, emptied out. Many of them are starting to add jobs, particularly in markets like Texas, Phoenix, and even uh, and even Florida. Um, and because of that, we're now beginning to see the recovery in vacancies take form. Also uh, note that the pace of those recoveries are uh, quite high, where we are seeing uh, vacancy drops of two to 300 basis points in some cases. And uh, apartments are pretty much the only product type where we're uh, witnessing this kind of a broad-based recovery uh, across both healthy and supply-constrained markets as well as typically high vacancy markets. So I believe at this point we have the results of the second audience question uh, that was sent out. And this again confirms that, uh, that the industry, as reflected by your thoughts, does not uh, view job growth as the main driver um, because if the job growth numbers are, are somewhat stagnant, uh, we should continue to see about the same rate of absorption uh, going into 2012, which, again, has been uh, very, very strong. So thank you for participating in those. We have two more questions for you throughout the presentation, which we'll, uh, we'll share. And uh, before I actually uh, turn the presentation over to my partner, Bill Hughes, let me go ahead and launch that question. And uh, at the end of Bill's presentation, we'll see what, uh, what your thoughts are. And that question has to do with interest rates. In 2012, do you expect interest rates to be somewhat higher, much higher, or about the same? Uh, notice I didn't put a choice in there for them to be lower because uh, uh, it, would, it would be difficult. I, I, I see Bill smiling here. It would be very difficult for the 10-year Treasury to go much lower than 1.9, I believe, as it was earlier this morning. Uh, so we didn't include that as a, as a choice. But once again, the third question is in 2012, do you expect interest rates to be somewhat higher, much higher, or about the same? And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to my partner, Bill Hughes. Bill? Thanks, Assam. Actually, before I jump into uh, capital markets, I have a question for you. You sure. know, you've given us a broad overview of the marketplace, economic marketplace. I'd like to know what's out there in your mind that gives you concern as we continue to move through this, this sort of choppy market. Sure. Well, I, I do feel very strongly that the U.S. Uh, economy is on much stronger footing for the reasons that I shared. Corporate profits, one of the things I didn't share, are way above, uh, well above where they were in 2006. So even that has gone uh, past its prior peak. Corporate balance sheets are in good shape. Um, a lot of that strength is concentrated in larger companies, 
the small to mid-sized bread and butter type of companies are still struggling. And that is a point of concern uh, for me in that I'd like to see the job growth broaden to smaller to mid-sized companies as well. And, and they face a lot of headwinds. They still won't have access to a lot of capital. They're still very concerned about uh, you know, the future direction of the economy and, uh, and where the lawmakers are, are going to take certain key issues like health care. Uh, however, I think we're, we'll continue to add jobs. What, what concerns me the most is the unexpected. When we talked about Europe, very hard to predict exactly um, where it'll go. The solutions they're proposing at least are closer to a systemic solution. But as we've seen in the last few days with Greece and, and Italy, there's still many, many problems to be resolved. Uh, if that uh, somehow blows up and if somehow creates problems for European banks, there is a lot of interconnectivity and the financial system, of course. Uh, and it's the, it's the unknown. Based on fundamental data as of right now and the evidence we've seen in the last 90 days, I think we should avoid recession and, and move on to the next phase of this growth, as slow as it may be, still positive. But it's the unknown, Bill. I'm holding you to that. <laughs> great. Thanks, great. Sam. Um, well, I, I don't think it comes as any great surprise or shouldn't come to any great surprise to anyone that these low interest rates uh, have really been drivers to the marketplace. Uh, these historically low rates have actually enticed uh, both institutional investors and private clients into the marketplace, certainly have helped cash flows and have driven cash and cash returns, and thirdly, have really supported uh, value creation and, and uh, better values uh, for our apartment sector. I think lenders, from a lender standpoint, these improving property fundamentals that Hassam's talked about generally across the board has really supported their level of confidence to be in the marketplace and be active. Clearly, we've, uh, it's been pretty easy to finance core major assets um, all the way down to C quality assets across the board. Uh, and we will, I think, continue to do that. It becomes a little choppy as you move into tertiary markets, smaller assets, smaller apartments. But even those are being financed in the marketplace, typically by local and uh, regional banks. Underwriting, uh, you know, we're starting to slip back uh, into some pretty aggressive underwriting standards. Of course, you know, everybody uses the agency underwriting criteria, 125 debt service coverage. I think most lenders look at that. Life insurance companies may be a little bit more uh, conservative than that. In some instances, the question is, you apply a debt service coverage to what NOI? Uh, but we have seen some local lenders, particularly in some of the gateway cities, major city, major markets, move to a 125 debt service coverage, which has really bolstered loan to values and helps us push beyond what we might traditionally be, be otherwise. Uh, capital uh, sources um, have uh, really moved uh, into the marketplace in a uh, competitive way. Uh, debt service coverage, um, you know, as I said, 125 improving. Uh, but the but the main factor for multifamily arena is really the broad assortment of capital sources that we have in the marketplace. Uh, certainly, Fannie Freddie have been stalwarts in working through a very difficult market period uh, in 2009 and 2010. They've continued to be uh, fairly aggressive, although maybe uh, in the last uh, 12 months they've lost a little bit of market share, but they continue to be sort of the the grounding to the multifamily arena. We've seen life insurance companies come in this last year and be much more aggressive, certainly put out more money and compete in some instances with the agency lenders. Uh, and then certainly you have commercial banks uh, but from local to regional to national lenders participating in the business. And I think that's been good for the marketplace as well. You know, CMBS really hasn't been competitive, and we'll talk a little bit about that, although I think there is a role for the CMBS market play. And lastly, we have uh, debt funds that are a uh, part of, of the market. Um, I want to talk a little bit about interest rates and what's going on here. I mean, obviously, there's been a, a, a pretty consistent relationship between core inflation and the 10-year Treasury. They tend to use in unif unison. 
Um, you know, if you look at the right hand part of this graph, however, you're going to see that core inflation has really moved to its uh, 10 year norm where the U.S. Treasury is uh, more than a couple hundred basis points off of uh, its 10 year average at at 428. Uh, particularly today, if you've noticed, I, you know, I woke up uh, this morning, 10 uh, year Treasury uh, had moved down below 2 percent yesterday. Uh, about this time, it was 220. It moved up to 208, moved down to close, I think, at 201. And as about an hour ago, it was not 196. So it's pretty amazing what's gone on. And clearly, these rates are far below, if you look at their 40 year averages, uh, far below uh, where their 40 year averages are. And we expect that to continue. Obviously, looking at the right hand side, if you see core inflation going up, the fact that they normally use it, move in unison, uh, you know, the reason it's not happening right now is I think it's just a fear factor. I think the consumer is tired of uh, good news, bad news, uh, the European debt crisis, all the issues that impact the marketplace have driven our 10 year treasury down south. Uh, as the uh, as the um, gold standard, so let's let's look at this market. As I said earlier, Fannie, Freddie, HUD, uh, the agency lenders. Um, this is really the story. Um, you know, a substantial part of the marketplace. We've seen life insurance companies back in certainly uh, commercial banks, uh, but in terms of market dominance, it has clearly been uh, the agencies. I know that both Fannie and Freddie, for instance are looking in 2012 to uh, expand their dollar output and put more dollars uh, into the marketplace. I think that bodes well for a consistent marketplace with uh, that is well serviced from the standpoint of debt. If we look at commercial um, delinquency rates, uh, clearly look at CMBS, and I know that doesn't play well, but I'll talk about the multifamily as it relates to this. Uh, third quarter, uh, CMBS rose 21 basis points to 977 in October uh, after having fallen for two months. It was 988 in July. Um, and when you look at multifamily as a part of that in October, it was 16.73%. Now, you know, that's a number of larger transactions that have been delinquent for a while. And uh, clearly, uh, it's, it's uh, sort of exacerbated that problem. Uh, six months ago, that was 1677, and a year ago, it was uh, 1463 for multifamily. So, uh, once again, a number of big projects that have caused those numbers to push out for multifamily. Bank thrifts delinquencies improved uh, since the third quarter of 2010, uh, having reached 441 in that in that that uh, third quarter, and now at uh, 393 uh, positive for banks. Um, and life companies, Fannie, Freddie, uh, have remained at historic lows, although if you look at the second quarter of 2010, uh, Fannie started to approach a 1% delinquency rate, uh, and uh, it was at 80 basis points, and now it's well below one half of 1%, which is where Freddie is as well. I think Freddie's something like 30 basis points, um, uh, just like life insurance companies, uh, pretty consistently low. Um, here's part of what is a potential problem for us, and I know it's uh, a problem uh, for the GSEs as well, and the amount of debt that's maturing, uh, particularly the next couple of years. Um, if you look from 2011 to uh, 2015 here, over $1.77 trillion dollars that are maturing in the marketplace. CMBS is a big chunk of that, but the big player here is really commercial banks. 2011 was just about $204.5 billion, and then you moved to 2013, $210.4 billion. Uh, life companies, 23.6 um, to $24.4 billion in 2013. And other, which are really uh, Fannie, Freddie, a good part of that, are the agency lenders last year were 66.58, but they move up uh, to 72, uh, almost 73 percent, and 74 and a half percent, 2012 and 2013, and that is of uh, concern. I know 
uh, to the agencies and how they're going to be able to deal with those and who are the lenders that may be able to step in to take some of those properties uh, that value is not in line with uh, current underwriting standards. Uh, so, you know, that, and we talked about current underwriting standards, uh, this is really marks the uh, the problem of the industry, and it's not so much full of multifamily, but I think it's worth uh, talking to, and that is of the $177 trillion expiring, uh, we've got a considerable amount of that that's underwater. Uh, 60% of that product is effectively underwater, and that is a uh, problem. Um, 2012, within terms, you got 136.5 billion, but out of terms, you've got 228 billion. In 2013, it actually gets wor- about, well, it's about the same, I should say, 149 billion uh, to 223 out of terms. Now, out of terms or underwater means, in this case, that the value is or the loan amount is greater than 100% of value. And therein lies the problem. Once again, we don't have that big a factor in the multifamily arena, but it is going to impact uh, those sources that are available to all of us uh, to use in, in the marketplace. I only want to bring up CMBS. While it's not a play, there's a place for CMBS in this marketplace for transactions that we're trying to finance in a little more aggressive basis. Um, transactions may be in, in some smaller markets, uh, that we could have used CMBS. Uh, 2010, we did about uh, 11 billion. This year, we're expecting 35 to uh, 50 billion. It's just not going to pan out. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But um, you know, right now we're about 27.2 billion. There's a issuance being priced and going to market now. RBS Wells Fargo is about 1.1 billion. We suspect that the market at the end of the year is going to be a 30 to 32 billion dollar market. Here's the reason that we've had some issues with CMBS. And if you look at where spreads have gone, uh, 10 year AAAs were 179 on July 8th. They soared to 339 on October 7th before rescinding to 283 by the end of the month. Now, with this transaction that was just recently priced, I know spreads have come in, which bodes well for the CMBS market, but even the multifamily arena needs that source in play to help us finance some of the product that's going to come to uh, maturity during this period of time. This this whole push out in spreads is caused by a lot of the things Assam spoke to, uh, European debt crisis, choppy domestic economy, the economy's inability to develop uh, employment opportunities, concerns over domestic debt, consumer confidence, all that has led secondary market investors to refrain or pull back from risk. Um, and when they pull back from risk, obviously we see spreads go out. And I know that in uh, issues that have gone to market over the last uh, 90 days, Triple A's have been really uh, oversubscribed where the subordinate pieces, subordinate tranches, uh, they've had a hard time uh, getting rid of those in the marketplace. Fannie Mae uh, spreads, we like to show this tier two, um, all in rates, uh, 10 year financing. You know, what can I say? Uh, you can get a 10 year deal pretty easily today at four and a half with Fannie with a full loan. Um, you know, it's about a 250 uh, basis point spread between Treasury and Fannie. You can even do better than that uh, with lower tiers. To moving from a tier two to a tier three, there's about a 15 basis point in rate. Uh, you move uh, from about 125 to 135 in debt service coverage, and that's how it kind of breaks out. Obviously, rates are very attractive, um, and we expect that to uh, continue for some time. So let's look at investor considerations if, if we can. Um, you know, debt and equity markets uh, uh, are going to really resemble for the next six months. We expect what we've seen in the last six months. There's just too much uh, choppiness in the economy to expect that we're going to have a reversal of fortunes overnight in terms of where rates are. And when I say fortunes, I guess I'm using that on sort of a negative basis that we, we, we want rates to stay where they are. I know all of you want rates to stay where they are, uh, and I just think that's going to happen. You've got a, an economy that's just not hitting on all cylinders. You've got 
you've got uh, global issues, you've got European domestic debt, you've just got all these issues that are going to cause uh, investors to uh, flock to a safe haven, which is once again the U.S. Treasury, and I think that's going to uh, continue for some time. Um, capital supplies, uh, agency lenders, I've already talked about them. I think both Fannie and Freddie and my conversations with uh, people within those agencies, they're both looking to really expand their business this year, put more money out, good quality assets. Life insurance companies, I know, are going to have greater allocations this year. They had bigger allocations last year than this year. They did start to compete in the second half of the year in the multifamily arena, where life insurance companies really do well, lower value, sort of uh, coastal, best-of-class assets. Uh, they can be under the agencies by 30 basis points, and we've seen some quotes that have been very aggressive uh, for five to ten year financings, actually more like seven to ten year financings, even some five years, uh, but certainly they're in play. Commercial banks will continue. We need them to. We need them to actually expand as well, and we expect commercial banks to do that. Uh, certainly, I would love to see MBS come back. That's really going to be based upon whether or not secondary market investors are more apt to take on more risk and chase yields. And I think where yields are right now, it's a good opportunity for those to buy those mortgages. And then finally, debt funds, we need those in some instances to recapitalize partnerships, recapitalize some of that debt that we can't underwrite to current standards today, and that's where we are. In terms of, you know, where are you if you've got a client, if you are a client and you're uh, uh, at maturity and you're a little bit underwater, certainly there's two approaches. One is becoming uh, a lot more challenging, and that is simply an extension. If, if the value of the property is equal to or greater than the uh, debt, uh, outstanding debt, you're going to have a hard time extending that loan. Um, they're going to expect you to go to marketplace, or lenders are going to be pretty aggressive to capture that asset and put it back out in the marketplace. Uh, otherwise, recapitalization. And that's why we need those debt funds. There are lots of ways and sources. Uh, CMBS would help because we can finance up certainly 75%, even a little bit beyond in some instances, uh, to be able to get those additional dollars to pay that debt off. If you're an investor and you're in the marketplace and you're financing straight financing, one to $10 million, uh, there's quite a lot of debt out there. There's small regional banks. There's Fannie Small product category. Uh, you know, that financing, uh, particularly banks, uh, typically five to ten year financings, you know, five uh, year financing, four and a half, four and seven, three, four and three quarters, uh, five year financing, 25 basis points, ten year financing, another 25 basis points. And if you're with Fannie and a small product, you're about 30 basis points uh, higher than their standard financing. So if you did a uh, tier two, um, a 10-year loan today with uh, with a small product category would be 30 basis points over the 450, so you're about 4, 480, certainly under 5%, great financing. And then as you move to 10 to 20, certainly it opens up. Um, certainly life insurance companies start to come into play, although aren't quite there. They're not going to be there until you get to uh, 20 uh, million and above, typically. And at that level, um, if you're not in the game doing a deal today, um, I, I don't know what entices you to be in the game. Uh, financing is great long term um, with everything that Hassam has spoke to and will speak to in the apartment sector. It's a great time to take down uh, long term fixed rate financing. Hassam? Great. Thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, this would be a great time to look at the results of our last question, which was the audience's expectation for interest rates. And uh, let's see what those results will look like. If we can uh, show those uh, responses, will be great. 58% uh, of the audience agree with you, Bill, about, 50, uh, about the same, not much change. And uh, even the 40.2% that believe it will uh, be a higher interest rate environment, it's only somewhat higher. Uh, certainly no expectation of a major increase in, in interest rates. Uh, so with that... Uh, given the uh, underlying importance of financing and, and low interest rates, let's talk about what's been happening in the apartment investment market. And uh, to start with, uh, looking at the volume of transactions so far this year, 
Uh, $44 billion of apartments have uh, traded uh, nationally, and that compares to $45 billion in all of 2010. So we're seeing a, a very nice improvement in the marketplace in terms of transaction activity. And the year-to-date number for 2010 through the third quarter was only $26 billion. So there has been a significant improvement in the marketplace. And because of that, we've seen a, pri- a price bounce uh, on the average uh, across the U.S. Uh, price per unit has been moving up uh, steadily since the bottom of the recession, and cap rates have been coming down. But what these macro trends mask for us is the top-down nature of the capital migration back into the marketplace. This graph really captures what happened from a percentage change standpoint in the number of transactions and dollar volume by price tranche. So you can see that the smaller $1 to $10 million product dominated by the private investor did not have the peaks and valleys uh, that, uh, conversely, the $20 million plus institutional uh, airspace has experienced. Um, and that uh, peak and valley has been dramatic uh, in the $20 million plus sector. As you can see on the graph, we're seeing 120% year-over-year increase in dollar volume of the larger assets. So the recovery really has been dominated by institutional capital coming back into the marketplace, seeking larger assets for economies of scale and, of course, um, quality product in primary markets. What that's done to buyer composition is also very interesting in that, uh, take a look at the pattern going back to 2007. In 2009, of course, they're in the midst of the crisis the private investor really was the dominant force in the marketplaces. It was the only category that could trade and that uh, the major product trading has come to a, had come to a virtual halt. As the market has improved and this top-down capital migration I'm talking about, you, you see the REITs and, of course, the um, institutional category come back very strongly to the point of making up uh, you know, a significant uh, a portion of the buying activity in the marketplace, especially the public sector, their uh, accounting for a much higher volume of the activity than even at the market peak in 2007. So REITs have really come a long way. They've recapitalized themselves very aggressively, and, and of course, they're very strong operators. So uh, the, the broader capital markets have rewarded apartment REITs in particular uh, very well since the bottom of the recession. Continuing with this analysis of the capital migration, take a look at the uh, cap rate trend movement by the same price tranches that we talked about earlier. Given that extreme pressure of capital coming into the 20 million plus category, you can see the cap rate reconversion since 2009 uh, really stand out in the 20 million plus category, uh, somewhat uh, showing in the 10 to 20 million category and not so much in the uh, 10 to 10, 1 to 10 million category, although there's been cap rate compression across the entire price spectrum in the marketplace, but it's acute when it comes to the institutional grade larger assets. Um, same thing if you take a look at uh, the, the trends uh, by class. Uh, class A product, of course, is dominating this flight to safety um, uh, sort of uh, demand for high quality investments, low risk um, investments, um, versus the class B, C uh, cap rates, which have not moved nearly as much. And in many ways, this is uh, indicative of the opportunity in the marketplace, especially for the small to mid-sized private investors in that they have a lot of room and flexibility in moving in and some of the more um, uh, mid-market, class B, class C, maybe some value-add investment opportunities now that there's more confidence about the fundamentals recovery in the apartment space and the fact that the economy is at least holding up pretty well and not going into recession. We also showed on this graph of preferred markets. This is really the dominant markets that tend to be on larger buyers' radar, um, and those cap rates have compressed even further. And uh, a lot of discussion is being held out there in various forums, whether it's the Urban Land Institute or National Mobile Housing Council, about whether there's a bubble in the Class A space, especially in the preferred markets. And, of course, when you look at the projected rent growth, the supply concern nature of... Uh, these uh, high-quality assets in the preferred markets, that really kind of counterbalances uh, the cap rate compression. Uh, the, the thin spread between these cap rates and the treasuries is somewhat of a concern. Uh, investors always have to look out for cap rate reversion or higher interest rates eventually. Um, but the fundamentals so far have supported what we've seen in the marketplace. The question is, where will the opportunity emerge? 
And one of the questions that uh, we wanted to share with you and, and have as our last audience question is the uh, following, if we can uh, set this up. In 2012, do you believe that investors will continue to prefer Class A primary metro uh, investments as this continuation of the flight to safety, or they will prefer to start investing more in Class B and or secondary metropolitan areas, or C, move aggressively toward value-add investing. So once again, the question for 2012 in terms of investment strategy is preference toward Class A, primary metros, more investments in Class B and secondary metros, or an aggressive move toward value-added investments. And we'll take a look and see what you all uh, think about uh, the best strategies. So looking at the repricing of risk now by metro, Take a look at what's happened with these primary markets we've been talking about in terms of cap rate versus secondary and tertiary. Certainly, there has to be a group of secondary markets that are relatively healthy and have decent economic bases and foundations that offer a much higher yield, as you can see on this on this graph, that will also participate in the rent growth that we believe is, uh, is emerging. Uh, but um, again, the institutional capital and larger major private investors uh, are uh, very much fixated right now on the uh, flight to quality. Um, one of the things that gives us confidence that demand for apartments is going to continue, not just because of the uh, very positive picture we're seeing on the fundamental side, but also just in terms of the financial aspects, uh, the rent growth uh, over the next three to five years counterbalanced with low interest rates, especially if they're locked in, um, is the spread between cap rates and, and interest rates. At a broad level, of course, if you look at the, those preferred markets or the Class A preferred markets, this band is going to be much tighter between uh, apartment cap rates and the 10-year Treasury. But at a macro level, the industry has the widest uh, uh, gap in terms of uh, cap rates and interest rates it's had since 1990. And any time that gap was relatively high, again, not quite as high as it is right now, in 1992, 1995, uh, and 2002, those periods turn out to be quite uh, strong uh, windows of time to invest in, in apartments. And uh, so that gives us a little bit of confidence that what we're seeing uh, does uh, speak well to the, um, uh, to the um, uh, notion that this is a great time to invest in, in, in apartments. Uh, so before we move over to our Q&A uh, discussion, let's uh, show the results of the last audience question, and that was your expectations of, of where investment strategies make sense. And the result is that investment in some Class B and secondary markets uh, for higher yields makes more sense. That is the dominant answer. 55% of you believe that there we'll see more capital moving toward the Class B and secondary markets, and uh, 24%. Uh, uh, believe that the Class A primary market acquisition is still the better strategy, higher than 20% now believing in the value-add investment. So very interesting to see that there's still risk aversion um, throughout the investment community. And a number of you have already asked the question, how big is the sample set of the people participating? We have over 2,000 participants on this webcast. It is hard for me to tell what percent of the people have actually answered the questions, but it's a relatively large audience. So even if we had a, a, a moderate level of participation, it should be a pretty good proxy for sentiment out there. Now, switching gears to our uh, Q&A session, Bill, I want to start with you. One of the questions that keeps coming up, um, we've received uh, several of them today, is what's the future of uh, Freddie and, and Fannie look like? Of course, they're still very active in the marketplace. There's a lot of speculation as to how they may be reformed. Uh, does that concern you? A lot of investors are concerned that there's, if there is reform, their role in the marketplace for apartment lending may be reduced somehow. Do you worry about that, or can you comment on that? Well, first of all, I'm going to say that the uh, multifamily operations in both those entities have performed quite admirably. They've made money. They haven't lost money. Right. Their portfolios are really very strong. Um, and so um, I think the first thing they need to do is sort of divide and conquer, get themselves away from the, the residential sectors in their firms. But, um, you know, it's going to take years before we get to that point, Hassam. The, the reality is our government is not positioned to be able to deal with that. Certainly in election year next year, I just don't think they're going to want to take that on. Right. The question of housing is very sensitive to uh, the American voter, and I, I just don't think that's going to happen. So 
uh, then you have to ask yourself, is it going to happen in 2013, 2014? I think eventually uh, something's going to be done, but um, I think that ultimately because they are profitable, uh, it will be a, uh, a entity that continues to support the multifamily arena in a large way. Uh, will it be private? Will it be public? Will it be uh, quasi-governmental? It's it's hard to say, but I just don't think you can get away uh, totally from government interac- interaction there and government support. Uh, it is not an issue for me today. I, I can't worry about four or five years from from today in terms of what goes on. And I, and I think there's m- much justification uh, both how, both sides of the of uh, the, the House, Congress, to to be able to support a continuation of those those entities, certainly on some basis. Well, the other aspect of that now, also, I think, I'd uh, love to get your comments on this, is that more participants are in the marketplace. You have live companies that are very aggressive. You have commercial banks that are healthier and coming back into the marketplace. Uh, whereas during the crisis in you know, 2009, even the first half of 2010, the agency lenders were pretty much the only game in town. Well, they're certainly, uh, you know, they were certainly much more important to us then, but they still control significant market no share, right. and right. We, we need them moving forward. How, what they're going to actually look like and how they're going to operate is really anybody's guess, and I've, I've heard a di- hundred different scenarios, and I'm not sure you could really go any direction of either sure. any of those scenarios right. in today's market. Bill, one of the questions that has come up from a number of our audience members has to do with what could go wrong with this relatively uh, positive forecast for for apartments. And the question is twofold. One is on the demand side, what could go wrong? And on the supply side, uh, will there be enough construction financing to potentially lead to some more rebuilding? Uh, Can you address the second part of that question? And I'll make some remarks about the (laughs) the demand side. Um, You know, the multifamily arena is the only arena in which construction financing is come back into the marketplace. There are a number of lenders in the marketplace, both uh, regional and, and national banks, who have participated in construction financing. They tend to be very well healed borrowers in markets where demand is demonstrated and solid. Um, there's certainly a lot more uh, entitlement going on right now than there are new construction loans being made. Typically today, you still need to have 20 to 25 percent equity to do a construction loan, so it's going to automatically slow some of those projects down. Um, and I'm sure there are some projects that might be prone to a little bit overbuilding, but certainly the lending sources today are going to provide breaks to a runaway train there, and I, I just don't see that that happening. Will it impact some markets? I, I think it will. Will it be substantial? No. Great. On the demand side of that uh, equation, the thing that I worry about the most isn't uh, anything going wrong with the fundamentals. The demographics certainly for favor renting, uh, the trend toward renting versus home buying, at least for now, uh, favors a, a very strong outlook on demand. What I do worry about, though, is income levels of renters not keeping up with rent growth. We still have a ways to go before rents exceed their 2006, 2007 uh, peaks, uh, but once we get to that point, when rents are starting to grow at four, five, six percent a year now, uh, if you count concession burn off on effective rents, and in some metros much higher than that, uh, and in some markets in double digit category, so at some point, uh, unless the job numbers really pick up and the job quality improves, uh, I do worry about affordability and whether we're going to get some renter pushback. Uh, regarding rents and how much you can really uh, push rents. Uh, some of the audience members, uh, actually more than one, send in the comment that today we have over 3 million job openings in the U.S., and September's numbers apparently just came out, which shows continued growth in, in job openings. So it's interesting we have the shortage of jobs being created, yet, yet we have a lot of job openings, and that speaks to the disconnect between qualifications for the kinds of jobs that we need to create and training and, and background versus the labor pool uh, that's out there. And that also speaks to, you know, metro selection and being in, in areas where we have an educated workforce aligned well with the kinds of jobs that are being created. But that was a point that several audience members made um, via, via the, the questions. Um, let's switch gears and talk about um, uh, your outlook, Bill, for distress. Uh, 
um, apartment distress has been kind of uh, kind of a uh, confusing trend in that the product type is doing better than any other. Yet there's been a fair amount of uh, distress sales that uh, statistically just show up on the radar along with other property types. What is your take on, ap- on apartment distress sales as, and where is it going in 2012 and 2013? Well, I, I would say that it's, it's got to increase slightly simply because you, of the major, with the, the maturity level or the maturities that are coming to play, market over the next, uh, two to three years. Certainly there's got to be some pressure for it increasing. Um, you know, I'm not sure, you know, when I, when I describe or talk about distress, I don't think of multifamily necessarily. And certainly those deals have been pushed to marketplace, uh, haven't gone into the marketplace at deep discounts. There is certainly stress in the marketplace. And certainly, um, it's, it's caused by, um, and relegated to tougher markets, no growth markets. Um, you don't see a lot of major core assets going to marketplace. Uh, in the distress category, and if they're good quality assets, uh, the discount that they're going into marketplace uh, are minimal. So uh, I, I think it's an issue, but I think lenders with their distressed assets, their legacy assets, have got to be uh, they've been pretty patient. They've learned from other experiences in years past that as long as the economy appears to be uh, moving in the right direction, if they are patient, have a little bit of time, that those properties will come back. The, the other side, as, um, as you pointed out, is with fundamentals being as strong as they are and improving and the, the fact that we're actually getting rent growth and we're actually seeing some new construction, uh, if I'm a lender and I've got an asset I'm taking back, I'm probably going to hold it for a while uh, to maximize its value before I move it to the marketplace. And that's why you're not typically seeing much discount when these properties go to market. And uh, the strength in the marketplace, both on the fundamental side and on the pricing side, should speak to the fact that we're, we really aren't headed for waves of no, product coming not to the market, all. which has been disappointing to a lot of investors, of course. But uh, that's the reality of, of this cycle. I think it surprised us a little bit because when we first saw it years ago and started to think about it, we thought that there's certainly going to be more uh, uh, product out yeah, there right. than, than what's really materialized. Right. Well, we've received a lot of questions that we didn't have time to answer. We'll... Uh, address those questions via email uh, on behalf of Bill, myself, all of our agents nationwide and loan originators that are part of the Mark Smilchop Capital Corporation team. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and attendance. We look forward to working with you in 2012. Thank you very much.